Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton stops by to discuss Super Bowl preparations and other city concerns. Also tonight, we'll hear how specialty schools in Arizona are preparing high school students for work and college. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. Super Bowl 49 will be played Sunday in Glendale, but Phoenix is the focus for plenty of pre-Super Bowl activities, including the NFL experience downtown at the Civic Center. We'll hear from Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton in a moment, but first, Governor Doug Ducey was among those welcoming Super Bowl fans and players to town this morning. If you think of the change in Arizona from our last Super Bowl to this one, how much we've grown, how vibrant it is, you uh, only have to go to downtown Phoenix to see the NFL experience and the Super Bowl experience and how, uh, what a wonderful direction we're headed in. So we want to maximize that as a state. We're really looking forward to showcasing this week and showing the world what we already know, and that's that Arizona is the place to be. Here now with more on how Phoenix is the place to be for quite a bit of Super Bowl hubbub is Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. Good to see you there. Good you, to see you. Always you, happy to be here. You look like a guy who's got a Super Bowl and coming activities in his town <laughs> for all, a couple of weeks here. It's going to be one heck of a good time in downtown Phoenix for Verizon, Super Bowl Central. Over a million people will visit our downtown. When I say our downtown, it's not just Phoenix downtown. It's our region's downtown. It's our state uh, downtown. There is a center of it all and it's in downtown Phoenix. A million people visiting to go to either NFL Experience or the concerts, the free awesome concerts that are going to be happening down there, the Bud Light, House of Whatever, and so many other fun uh, activities. There's a rock wall which kind of represents the Grand Canyon which mm -hmm. is kind of our, our wow factor. Family friendly fun and it's our responsibility. Look the game's in Glendale and we want Glendale to have, be the best host for the game itself and we want to do our part to be the, the, the one place in the state where you can host a million people over a four day period and we plan to do our part well. How much does all this family friendly fun cost? This, first off, um, the Super Bowl is well worth the effort. Not just the financial effort, but the human effort. This is a massive logistical planning uh, effort to pull this off in the right way. But when Mike Bidwell convinced the NFL owners to pick Phoenix, he promised them that we would be the very best host city in terms of hospitality and fun that they've ever had in the history of the 49 Super Bowls. And that's exactly what we're going to deliver in uh, Phoenix. It's going to cost us about a million dollars in overtime for public safety. And that's money well worth it because if there is an incident, we hope and pray there's not and we're prepared for anything, we don't want any... Uh, leader of the police department worried about cost. You got to deal with the issue and manage the issue and get it taken care of as quickly as possible. All the other costs for the city are actually already built into our budget. So it is less cost intensive than people might expect. It's time intensive. It's people intensive. You have to coordinate with other uh, jurisdictions and the state and the federal government. It's a massive logistical affair, but the cost is well worth it because not only in the short run are we going to have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars come into our local uh, economy. Obviously, the long-term benefits are spectacular. The ability of us to say to the country and the world, you are welcome here. This is a warm, welcoming place. You're going to have the best hospitality in the United States of America, right here in Phoenix, Arizona. Many decision makers from large corporations and, and, and other entities are going to make decisions about future job location. That positive experience they have here in our community is going to pay long-term dividends. For critics who say these types of things don't bring in the kind of money that you hear and that actually is not worth the expense, something like a Super Bowl. How do you respond? Well, I would disagree and disagree uh, strongly. There is no event on planet Earth that is going to galvanize the number of eyeballs on our community as a Super Bowl. Yes, I know that most of them are there to watch the Patriots uh, play the Seahawks and hopefully it's a wonderful uh, football game. But the images that they see, the, the number one, the weather images, but the various TV commentators talking about the positive experience and the, and the hundreds of thousands of fans that are visiting here from around the country and the world to go back to their communities and tell them what a great experience it was. Uh, for them to feel the energy that's going on here. Phoenix is a city on the rise. When we have this conversation 10 years from now, uh, we're gonna feel that Phoenix has made some very smart policy choices that position our economy well 
those decision makers are going to understand that. They're going to feel what's happening here and it's going to put us in a better position when they make decisions about future investment and uh, job creation. Short-term benefits, obviously hotels and restaurants and bars and art galleries, long-term benefits in terms of uh, economic decision making and of course many are going to come back for conventions and business meetings etc because of that positive experience it overall is worth it last question on this this blizzard back east and especially in the northeast you got a lot of patriot fans uh, in that particular part of the world this is serious bit i mean they shut down the subway for goodness sakes unprecedented back there um how is that impacting what's going on out here from sky harbor to downtown and all the whole nine yards so well speak. first off as we plan for our big events uh, here and we're going to be in the high 70s and low 80s and have spectacular uh, weather, the envy of, uh, of the world. Uh, first off, our prayers are with uh, last year's host city, New York, New Jersey, uh, because they're being hammered right now as we speak in over the next uh, 24 to 36 hours. So our thoughts and prayers are with those people and their safety. Obviously, we're monitoring the situation very, very closely. We know that the worst of it is supposed to be in the next day, day and a half. So we, we believe that the fans who are coming in for uh, the game uh, will have an opportunity uh, to do so and get here in time so that they can enjoy Super Bowl Central for a few days in advance of the game. So we are, we are watching it very closely, but we're optimistic that the fans from the Boston area, those hardcore Patriot fans, are going to be able to come to Phoenix and enjoy all that we have to offer yeah, as well. well. Once they can get out of their house, I guess, and get down to the airport. First thing first, yeah. pray for their safety, get them, get them uh, through this time period safely, and then get to Phoenix and enjoy yourself here. Speaking of flights, the FAA apparently is not going to go back to original routes, which is uh, not a good thing for a lot of neighborhoods in Phoenix. Talk to us about this, that they might be adjusting. The, what does that mean, and what is going on here? Well, this is a very, very frustrating situation. And as mayor of this city, I'm pretty angry about the situation. Here's what I'm most angry about. You know, in government, sometimes you have very difficult decisions to make, sometimes difficult decisions that impact people's lives. You should always talk to them, seek their input, get their ideas before you implement a change. That's what, that's what transparency in a public process uh, is all about. Unfortunately, the FAA, before they adopted what's called the next-gen departure procedure out of Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport, because of a congressional action, was not required to go through a public process. Normally they would have been, but they made an exception for this next-gen uh, process. And so they adopted a procedure, didn't give appropriate public notice, didn't hold any public meetings so that they could get uh, input. Uh, they adopted the procedure, and unfortunately it is causing thousands and thousands of households to have noise levels that were much higher than the FAA predicted they were going to be, really hurting their quality of life. Our demand as a city, unanimously, is that the FAA go revert back to the original departure procedure and let's go through the process uh, appropriately. I met recently and Congressman Ruben Gallego, the brand new congressman representing Central Phoenix, he and I met together with Michael Huerta, the FAA administrator, expressed our frustration, our anger on behalf of the citizens uh, of our community. Uh, right after the Super Bowl, they're going to be getting together a working group, which is going to be looking at changes so that it does have significantly less impact uh, on those uh, neighborhoods. I'll be regularly reporting back to you and to this community on how, how it's going. Um, and so I think we're going to cooperate uh, with them and give them, we're going to provide them options that we think work for, uh, for Phoenix. Is a lawsuit still a possibility if they don't budge? Yes. All right. And that's down the line. I mean, how, how long do they have to budge? Well, I don't want to litigate on Horizon. I like to give many <laughs> oh, of the secrets oh, of the city on, on Horizon, but I don't want to litigate a, uh, a lawsuit here on, uh, on Horizon. But I would just say that, yes, uh, firmly uh, on our side is the, the option of litigation if necessary. First and foremost, we want to provide information to the FAA, let them know how frustrating it's it, for the people of, uh, of Phoenix, let them know that they did not follow the appropriate historic preservation uh, requirements before they implemented uh, this, give them a chance to do the right thing, but yes, litigation is an option. Real quickly, are they aware that litigation is an option? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Chief Garcia, we haven't had you on in quite a while. You know, we, we missed December, so we, we missed you greatly. Um, uh, Chief Garcia, uh, did he deserve, did he deserve to get fired? Yes. Um, one thing uh, that you cannot do as the police chief of a city like uh, Phoenix is to be insubordinate to the civilian leadership. At the end of the day, civilians uh, are in charge of the city. The mayor and council are the boss of the city manager. The city manager is the boss of the police chief. And 
we can, we can deal with a lot of things, but insubordination, direct insubordination by uh, the police chief to the civilian leadership of the city is not acceptable. And so uh, our city manager uh, made a tough decision, and I believe the right decision to terminate the police chief for that direct act of insubordination. He was saying in the press conference that led to the insubordination charges there, uh, that he was targeted for making officers accountable, and he's, his quote was that the city has to decide, do they want a police department run by plea, the union, or do they want it run by the chief? Was that a valid argument? All, all, look, everything that the police chief had to say, we ought to, we ought to listen to, and he should have come met with myself, come met with mayor, members of the council, come met, meet with the uh, city manager. What you can't do, and because his termination had nothing to do with any of those issues, his termination was due to his direct insubordination to a direct command uh, by the city civilian uh, leadership. Look, there is turbulence within the Phoenix uh, uh, Police Department. Obviously, um, many of the rank and file members had publicly expressed their frustration with the chief. He was expressing frustration uh, on the other side. Um, it's two things I want the public to understand. First and foremost, the chief's termination had nothing to do with those issues. It was a direct act of insubordination. Secondarily, um, whatever turbulence is going on at the top of the organization, which by the way with Chief Yonner uh, is really going well right now. Chief Yonner is an outstanding police professional and he's doing a great, great job as our interim uh, police chief. But at the rank and file level, our police officers are doing incredible work. Our crime rate is at a record low level. And so I don't want anyone in the community to be concerned that turbulence at the top of the organization is impacting the quality of police services that they're receiving at the street level in terms of crime rate uh, and all the great work that our police officers do. We have an outstanding Phoenix Police Department. And if Chief Garcia, while I was here, left the impression that we didn't have an outstanding police department, he's wrong. He's wrong. We had a great police department 10 years ago. We had a great, great police department yesterday, today, and for decades to come, it's going to be among the very best in the country. He may agree that it's a, a great police department, but he says it's being run by the unions, and they have the final say, not those who should have the final say. Has he got a point? No, he is wrong about that, uh, wrong about that uh, issue. Uh, the, poli the police chief uh, was supported by our uh, city manager. There were issues, well, you had certain council members calling for an immediate termination. You didn't hear that from the other council members. We wanted to hear from the community, uh, hear from the rank and file officers, hear from uh, city management as well as leadership within the department making these important uh, decisions. But the, the decision to terminate the chief had nothing to do with those other issues. It was a direct act of insubordination. And if we stand for anything, as the civilian leaders of the city, we cannot allow that uh, to occur. You have to uh, work with the civilian leadership and you can't act in, in that way. Otherwise, uh, unfortunately, termination is the right thing to do. Real quickly before you go, will we have a permanent chief in place by the time you get back here next month? Well, that, that's a decision for our city manager. Our city, as you know, we hire and fire the city manager. He makes all mm -hmm. personnel decisions. I will say this, I've worked with Chief Honor for many years. He's a great guy, a great leader of that uh, department. And if our city manager were to make the decision that he is the right permanent uh, leader of that department, um, he's going to hear nothing but praise from me. All right. Mayor, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. As always, thanks for having me. Tonight's edition of Arizona Education looks at specialty schools. These schools offer a chance for students to explore a specific career path and gain real-world experience while still in high school. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Scott Olson look at one specialty school that's building a future workforce. Kelsey Lucas may only be 17 years old, but she already knows what she wants to be thanks to a program at her high school. It definitely helped me choose to go into an engineering pathway. Kelsey attends Crest at Paradise Valley High School. Jack Clark oversees the program. Crest is an acronym that stands for the Center for Research in Engineering, Science and Technology. Crest has three areas of study, biotechnology, engineering, and computer science. And the reason that we chose to focus on engineering, biotechnology, and computer science is because that those areas uh, in the 
in industry were identified as lacking in those high quality, highly trained students. And so uh, there is opportunity and will be additional opportunities in the future for kids coming out of Crest. Students apply to the specialty program in eighth grade. What we're really looking for is motivation and dedication and not only the ability but the desire to learn and to work at a high level. Starting their freshman year, the students concentrate on a problem or challenge they want to solve. During the next four years, they research ways to fix it, design a solution, and then senior year, they build their design. Kelsey and her team are working on a portable water purification device. Uh, our lens has ridges which collects sunlight and sort of directs it into a focal point and we direct that focal point towards our tin can which will boil the water and create steam which the, the steam then goes up through our condensing coil and becomes regular water again. Now all the impurities and minerals that we don't want will be remain in the can which is easy to open up and empty out whenever they want. The device could have far-reaching effects. Many diseases that they get in third world countries are due to their, their water purity. So this system will potentially save many lives, especially with the younger, the younger population and the elderly that live there. Seniors also participate in an internship. TGen, SRP, and McCarthy Construction are on the list. These companies are able to get a jump start on creating the kind of workforce they need and students translate their hands-on experience into a valuable asset. Uh, opportunity that, that they're able to take advantage of, networking and relationships that they're able to build, uh, as well as content knowledge to prepare them to move into STEM uh, majors, uh, STEM programs of study uh, when they go from high school to college. At Crest, you can see the students creating a new future for all of us. And Kelsey, for one, cannot wait to get started on hers. I'm extremely excited to graduate and, and sort of with Crest under my belt, I feel like I've accomplished so much just in high school. And here now to talk more about specialty schools is East Valley Institute of Technology Superintendent Sally Downey. Michelle Launderville, a biotech teacher at Paradise Valley High School's Crest, the Center for Research in Engineering, Science and Technology. And Greg Donovan, Superintendent of Westmec, the Western Maricopa Education Center. It's good to have you all here. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. As far as schools like Crest, just in general, specialties, how many we got here in Arizona? Oh, that's a good question. 14. 14. 14. There are 14 joint technical education districts across the state of Arizona. This past November, the Yuma County residents voted to form a joint technical education district. So we now have this type of education available to students across the state of Arizona. And we just saw Crest. Compare Crest to EVIT. What is, what is the difference? Well, Crest is a program, I believe, that's housed at Paradise Valley School District. Uh, EVIT is a separate campus. Uh, our students attend from 10 different districts and come to our centralized campus for a half a day of training in one of 40 programs. So it sounds as though we've got 14 in the state. Uh, this one differs from the one right. you're at. Right. So in general, there are options out there, aren't there? There are, and we actually are housed at Paradise Valley High School, so the students don't have to have any transportation throughout the day, and they can take all of their um, regular education classes at this one location. What is the difference between applied learning and specialized learning? I mean, is, is it the same thing? Is there a difference? What, what's, what, what are we talking semantics? Well, I think we are talking semantics a little bit, but if you want to take the hardest definition of applied, is you take a very specific field of interest rather than any teacher could use an example of how you might apply something. But here we have a group of students who say, I want to know how this applies to the field that I'm interested in, whether that's medical assisting, sports medicine, culinary arts, or one of the transportation programs. And the benefits of that kind of education. Oh my, there's an old saying that tell me something I hear it, show me I see it, but involve me in it and I learn it. And that's what applied education is all about. And the specialized schools, it, it, can you be too applied? Can you lose a little bit of a general education? It's a combination. There has to be theory. The cognitive piece is very important, but the hands-on piece is just as important. So it's a balance of the two, and the outcomes are spectacular because the, the students are focused, they're really involved in their learning, 
And we have proof at EVIT because two out of three of our students go on to college. And we have a 98% high school graduation rate. As far as that idea that there maybe there's too much flexibility and focus and somehow a general education might get lost, how do you respond to something like that? I don't think so. I think this is giving students choice. I think that for the students who are ready for these types of programs, who already have a passion for a particular field and who, who kind of are already um, thinking about their careers beyond high school, it gives them an opportunity to get ahead. And one of the things that I would like to say um, and kind of piggyback on what Dr. Downing was saying, we not only focus on content and applied skills, but we look at employability skills as well. We are all kind of governed by people from the business community who have helped write our standards, and part of a, a separate group of standards is specifically employability. So we can go that one step further. I mean, I've been a regular general education classroom teacher for most of my career, and by doing this, we're also specifically helping students prepare for the workplace. And some of those soft skills that um, employees may often get fired for for not having those skills. Mm -hmm. We're working on that with those students now. Yeah, the, the idea, I, I guess soft skills is kind of what I'm talking about. Not necessarily right. straight focus, but just the general idea of a general education. Right. That's important too. Showing up for school. Showing uh, up, yeah, like showing being up on time. Work, right? yeah. Working with other people. Communicating. All of that Absolutely. is very, very but important. We know why you're here. Arizona Department of Education, their statistic Students who have taken two or more CTE classes, 96% graduate from high school. So those general education students, we know generally the graduation rate is not anywhere close to 96%. Can you get that general education with those students? Absolutely. How so? They continue to take all those classes and we hear from parents regularly how every day was a fight and now they're on the honor roll at their regular high school and certainly they're in that A, B category for us as well. Everything begins to fall into place. It all makes sense. I hear about government regulation in the field that I'm learning. The applied mathematics, chemistry, geography. Where does this stuff come from? I mean, it all just starts to make sense. What is a good specialized school or program? What defines a good program? Well, in my opinion, it's one that focuses on the students. Uh, if you can find a passion that a student has, then you can turn it into a paycheck and you can set them on a path for success. But students, we know as educators, we've known for years that one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. So you have to find the size that fits the student you're serving. And that's what we try to do with our 4,000 students at EVIT. At 4,000 students, that's a lot of sizes over there. a lot of sizes. Yeah. It, can, it be, it can it be difficult at times? Oh, sure. It can be difficult. But I can tell you that once you find that, that key, that passion, the students soar. When you find that passion and they soar, what happens if they're soaring over here but as they age and they get older, they think they may want to go over there. Well, one of the great things that we do at Crest is we have um, three specific programs that we focus on in computer science, which is new this year, bioscience, and engineering. And with, we have them for four years. We have a four-year program mapped out for them, but they also have flexibility to explore other things. I know that I have several students who are also taking culinary and um, forensics or healthcare classes as well. So they do have that flexibility to go beyond just the program that we have and explore other options and passions. Are these schools open to all students? Are there waiting lists? If a kid wants to get in, can a kid get in? Yes, yes, and yes. We are very popular, and all of us and across the state, there are programs where there are waiting lists, and there's also programs where we have open seats. Student interest drives a lot of things, but we have that opportunity. I'd like to add that one of the other things that makes us successful is working with that business and industry relationship. Making sure we're, our student-centered is key. But we're answering that question, why? Because if you're interested in this, this is what employment demands. These are the credentials you must have. These are the skills you must know. And we contribute to the economy by turning out students who can be contributors to our society and be there. Last point on this. Mm -hmm. What do parents watching right now need to know about specialized schools if it still seems like a foreign concept to them? Well, they do need to do a little bit of their research. All of our programs are driven by business and industry, and what they need to research are the outcomes. There are some marvelous job opportunities uh, in our workforce here in Arizona and across the country 
as long as we can equip the student with a business and industry certification that's recognized everywhere. And once I think they do the research and see that, they'll think, hmm, every scholar does need a skill. All right. Well, very good. It's good to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining us. We certainly do appreciate it. And Thank continue you. good work. Thank the you. Opportunity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Helios Education Foundation is proud to underwrite Arizona Education, a 12-month series highlighting the issues affecting college and career readiness of our students. Through a decade of strategic partnerships, Helios is working to change lives and strengthen communities through education.